Welcome to the webinar on Defending Bank Enforcement in FDIC DNO Suits, Latest Cases, Defenses, and Successful Litigation Strategies. This webinar is jointly produced by five of the nation's leading law firms, Arnold Porter, Deckert, Buckley Sandler, Williams and Connolly, and Venable. I'm Ron Glantz, Chair of the Financial Services Group at Venable. I'm joined by Tom Bartanian, uh, who heads up the uh, Financial Services Group at Deckert, and Tom and, Tom and I will be co-moderators today. We will follow a question and answer format with plenty of comments and observations from the other members of the panel. Uh, to ask questions, please use the chat feature on the left side of your screen. Our speakers will have also included excellent course materials which are online and will be provided to you tomorrow in our thank you email. A link to the recording of this webinar will also be provided. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers, uh, including three former colleagues of mine in the government. Uh, Tom Bartanian, partner at Deckert, Richard Alexander, a chairman and partner at Arlen Porter, Allison Baker, a partner at Venable, formerly at the CFPB, Bob Lettig, partner at Deckert, Andy Sandler, chairman and executive partner, Buckley Sandler, and John Villa, partner at Williamson Connolly and longtime member of the executive committee. Uh, let me turn it over now to Mr. Bartanian. Thanks, Ron. I think. Uh, our days of uh, government service now, I think we're back when the dinosaur ran the, uh, the land. <laughs> the last century. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, what we've got here is um, a, a terrific group of luminaries, and I guess Ron and I have practiced with and against most of the folks in this room for more than 30 years, and we've seen an awful lot of developments in the enforcement and DNO area, and what we'd like to do today is is talk about the practical realities of what's happening, how it's happening, and uh, where we think it's going over the next several years. In that regard, let me provide just a brief overview. We have been sur uh, surveying uh, at Deckard over the last 10 years all enforcement cases that have been handled by any of the banking agencies, and I include the banking agencies today to include the Department of Justice and the CFPB. Uh, so the, the first trend that we're going to have uh, before us is obviously the trend of the obvious need for more regulators to go after banks, which uh, is a problem in and of itself. But over the last 10 years, we have been surveying and mapping every enforcement case that has come down, and I just want to give you some overview of numbers and trends to, to sort of set the tone here. Um, between 2004 and 2009, there were 2,000 67 formal enforcement actions brought by the banking agencies, uh, and that was about 413 a year. 413 tended to be, <clears throat> for about the last 20 years, the average. And people often ask why it always came out to about 400 or 450 enforcement actions. Is that the number of people who do something wrong every year? And actually, no. It's the number, it's the amount of resources that the regulators have to bring cases. So. Uh, that's why the numbers tended to be around the 400 range year after year. Uh, in 2009, uh, obviously, uh, the world changed dramatically in terms of enforcement actions, and between 2009 and 2014, the close of business 2014, there were 6,064 formal enforcement actions. That's 1,000 a year. Um, that's a lot of resources, and that's a lot of banks. If you assume that most banks don't have more than one formal enforcement proceeding, and that may not be right, but if you assume that they don't have more than one formal enforcement proceeding in five or six years, uh, that's 6,000 financial institutions. Add on to that, probably in that time frame, another 6,000 uh, informal memorandum of understandings uh, and informal agreements with the regulators, which are, do not count as formal enforcement actions that have to be disclosed. Um, that sort of covers just about every bank in the United States in the last five years, having some sort of informal or formal uh, problem with the regulators, uh, which tells you a lot about what's happened and particularly what's happened in the last few years. And just to pick out one year, 2010 and 11 were sort of the high points for enforcement. 2010 was 1,500 enforcement actions, 2011, 1,250. Um, so what are the trends that we're seeing now in terms of 
these high numbers of enforcement actions. Uh, I've got maybe six or seven trends I'll, I'll start with, and then we'll, we'll jump into a few of these issues. Uh, the first is that we've got more regulators, um, and, and that is by itself an interesting trend. Over the years, we see more and more uh, of these enforcement actions uh, involving upwards of five, six, or seven state and federal enforcement actions uh, and in regulators, uh, which makes it all the more complicated to get these things resolved, particularly if there's a simultaneous grand jury proceeding or a criminal proceeding going on. The second thing we've seen throughout the crisis, obviously, is the focus on big ticket items. Mortgage-backed securities cases, foreign currency, LIBOR, big problems, big banks, big recoveries, big headlines, big press releases. Uh, number three uh, is the trend uh, of perhaps the Congress, perhaps regulators, perhaps others to control businesses through uh, the financial system, and that is sort of the choke point theory of regulation. Uh, that you can moderate who has access to financial services, you can moderate the ability of those businesses to do business in this country. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, on the issue of multiple enforcers, uh, I, I thought it was interesting that Jamie Dimon in his letter to shareholders uh, in the annual report for 2014 actually went out of his way to indicate his complete concern and disdain uh, for the number of enforcement actions that are going on, not only that, but the number of enforcement agencies that are piling on to each one of these different actions. Uh, and he actually had, a, had a, a few sentences in his shareholders' letter indicating his concerns. Uh, another trend that we'll talk about is the increased level of CMPs and damages. I mean, we've gone from the last 20 years a point when a million dollars seemed like a big CMP to now seeing 16 billion, 13 billion dollar uh, damage awards, restitution, and, and the like. Uh, and so the numbers have really, uh, really increased exponentially. Uh, and the last two points is one of the trends that we see, with is, which is going to continue, I think, uh, more than we've ever seen over the last 10 years, is a focus on risk management in financial institutions. <clears throat> regulators com complete focus on risk management and the ability to manage the risk in that each entity and uh, the likelihood that more and more institutions are going to see enforcement actions if they don't manage the risk in the form that the regulators expect. And lastly is the trend towards going after individuals, uh, which we've seen uh, building over a number of years. It really started in 2013 when Eric Holder started mentioning that some banks were probably too big to prosecute, and a number of us, I think, at the program that year said, well, the logical conclusion of that is you've got to go after individuals if you can't bring down the banks because they're too big to prosecute. Uh, and so we've now come full circle, and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, Department of Justice memorandum on that uh, in the next uh, hour and a half. So we've got a lot to cover. And we're going to start right off with some recent developments in the uh, fair lending and disparate impact area. And I'm going to start by asking uh, Bob Lettig what he thinks the implications are of the Supreme Court's decision in the Texas Department of Housing case uh, that has come down recently. Well, uh, Andy and I have had a candle out for the last 10 years waiting for uh, a, a positive decision in this case, and the candle was snuffed out. I called Andy that morning, and, uh, and Andy, always the optimist, uh, indicated there were rays of sunshine in the, uh, in the decision, and so we can, we can talk about that. Um, <clears throat> I think the main point of the decision is that disparate impact has been validated as a theory, albeit five to four, with a very strong dissent. Um, to be used in FHA and ECOA cases. So uh, to the extent there was reason to think, pretty good reasons, I thought, that, uh, that this might not be available, I think the, uh, the majority in the Supreme Court has uh, taken that away for the present time. Um, <clears throat> I, the practical impact, I think, is that this gives uh, encouragement to the government and to private parties to bring suits 
based on uh, disparate impact theories where perhaps they would not have done so before. Now, the opinion, when you actually look at this opinion, it's very interesting because number one, we're, we're really bootstrapping one thing that we start with employment law, and have, then we look at a case here about government housing policy decisions, and now we have to take from that something about someone getting a loan or not. And there are many, many steps uh, and sinews along the way to sort of try to connect all of that. What I thought was very interesting about the opinion was the majority's effort to try to say we are not opening the floodgates of litigation in this regard, and we're expecting district courts to strongly police this in, I think, guys, ir uh, unlikely ways <laughs> that, that um, as a practical matter, the plaintiffs will have a strong ground to work from in, and will it will be difficult I think for the district courts to impose all the barriers that the Supreme Court is assuming. Now one great example of this is the Eighth Circuit decision, the classic one out in, uh, uh, in, in St. Paul involving housing where uh, there was housing code enforcement involving apartments aimed largely at making better conditions for renters in St. Paul, and the landlords used the FHFA, FHA to sue, saying that this was having a disparate impact on minorities. And the Eighth Circuit said, yep, that's right. And so the dissent was apoplectic about this as an example of how the FHA could be misused. And interestingly, the majority uh, specifically referenced that and said, gee, you know, we're not ruling on that case, but we don't think that that case probably would have gone the same way if our barriers, such as they were, would, be, would have been imposed. So um, what you have here is certainly the ability to say as a defendant, you know, you shouldn't just allow a plaintiff to have all the benefits of the doubt here and not, not take into account legitimate uh, government slash private sector um, views in terms of making decisions and choices rather than creating some sort of absolute uh, liability situation. So Andy, what, what's, your, um, what's your take on the situation? And by the way, Andy, before you talk, I just wanted the audience to know that, there were, that we're not flipping any slides. This is, uh, this is a discussion between the, the group. So. For people who are uh, asking questions about what the next slide is, you, you've got the one and only slide up there. Yeah, um, so Bob, uh, I, I am a little more optimistic um, and positive about it than you are earning my well-earned moniker, Mr. Sunshine. Um, clearly, it would have been better had the Supreme Court stated clearly disparate impact is not appropriately used under the Fair Housing Act. I think that's your view, Bob. It's my view. It's the view of most of the defense bar. But the Supreme Court, the ultimate judiciary in the land, has taken a different view. However, and you also note they did it in the housing context. And they set some parameters for when disparate impact can properly be used, which I think, if followed by the lower courts, and there's an awfully big if there, essentially precludes its use in the lending context. Um, essentially, the court said it, used to, it needs to be used very, on a very limited basis, very carefully, and with restraint. We're going to talk about some other recent cases um, that indicate that that's not the way the government is using it currently in terms of seeking consent decrees from financial institutions. However, there's a series of cases out there right now where I think we may see that fleshed out in a positive way. And specifically, those are the cases by municipalities around the country uh, against various lenders, Miami, Chicago, Los Angeles, Atlanta, where the municipality is claiming damages um, from uh, the lending practices uh, of a number of lenders over a long period of time, and particularly the way they service and collect. Uh, and, they, and I think as those cases work their way through, uh, judges are going to be forced to confront some of these issues. 
because the district courts have been going different ways on some of these issues, uh, we're going to get at least the 11th Circuit weighing in perhaps again, uh, perhaps the 7th Circuit weighing in again, perhaps even the 9th Circuit weighing in again, and hopefully we're going to see some useful clarification that might uh, encourage the government and others who believe this was a great victory uh, to take more seriously the need to be careful circumspect, and circumspect in the way they use disparate impact in the lending context. So you guys are you guys are really steeped in this stuff. And what I want to do is, is is bring it down to a very fundamental question. I'm a loan officer in a in a financial institution. What's going to get me in trouble in terms of underwriting, and what's going to be a legally sufficient justification that I can offer up to defend myself if if somebody comes after me and says I've discriminated? based upon some fair lending uh, disparate impact information. So the problem with disparate impact um, as applied by the Justice Department, the CFPB, and other enforcement and prudential agencies at present is there is no stated legitimate business justification. They know discrimination when they see it. It's the old Potter Stewart pornography standard. And it's really kind of evolved to paint by numbers. If the statistics show disparities, then there's a, there's a risk that the government is going to seek to impose penalty. So you have to not think about it as business justification and magic bullets. There are none. You have to think about it as risk management. And in terms of effective risk management, it's understanding where you have a disparate impact, looking very hard at what your practices are and whether there are ways to diminish that disparate impact. And insofar as it's just not practical or, or and you don't have the ability to do it, either because of the kinds of products you offer or the expertise you might have, to be very clear in documenting that you looked at the issue, you considered the issue, and, um, and that you're comfortable that your business practice itself is fair and non-discriminatory. Bob, additional thoughts? Additional thoughts. I think now I'm going to be Mr. Glimmer of Sunshine here. Uh, I believe the October 2013 joint release by the banking agencies and the CFPB is probably the most positive thing for lending institutions since 1994. You had the QM coming in, okay, and people were saying, if we go QM only, we are going to have, in all likelihood, a disparate impact uh, from that decision. And they were besieging the agencies as to, you know, what, where, what does this do to us? The agencies, of course, responded in a somewhat cryptic manner, saying, all things being equal and not being inconclusive and so forth, um, the, the, the basic message was, if you do Q, a QM only and you base it on actual analysis of certain factors that seem to be business related, and they gave sp three specific factors, credit risk, well, I guess the government has sanctioned QM as a way to have less credit risk, so it'd be hard for the Justice Department to sue you on that one, I suppose. Um, secondary market opportunities, well, you know, liquidity is pretty important and the ability to sell a loan and how non-QMs are going to be treated in the secondary market I think was relatively observable as not that positive at the time. Capital requirements and overall liquidity risk, you know, are you going to have loans that you can sell forgetting about secondary market? So I thought that putting those four factors out there, Andy, was, was very helpful in terms of these are reasonable things. But it's interesting. The agency said, but we're not giving any guidance as to what degree or level. And that's what this all comes down to. Pretty much anybody can throw up some good plausible reasons. The question is, if you can make a 10% profit versus a 6% profit, depending on a different standard, is 10% is, is it okay just to go for 10 because you can get it, or do you have to scale it back to 6? And I don't think, Andy, there's been any cases that have come close to saying, no, it's 8.2. Yeah. Well, but there are, there are a number of current investigations which lead me to state categorically QM is not a safe harbor and that the exceptions swallow the rule. 
And so in the all things being equal? Yes. <laughs> um, and so I you know, I think we're in for a very, very difficult role. Look, this is political as much as anything else. Access to credit is a big problem in this country. Part of the cause of the access to credit problem, not all of it, but part of it is the aggressiveness of government regulation, which scares lenders to only make super prime loans. The redlining enforcement program is about forcing lenders to solve the access to credit problem, period. And therefore, QM cannot possibly be a safe harbor where they won't accomplish that very clear political objective. But Andy, wasn't Dodd-Frank all about never making aggressive and bad loans all again? I mean, isn't the government running into itself? All right. So I'm, I'm, as a loan officer, I'm getting hives. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know what I can do to say stay out of trouble. You should go to the Falklands. <laughs> right. so, so I've got two questions. At the front end, what does my compliance program need to be look like so that I have a defense and I perhaps don't get uh, a, 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 a fair lending allegation against me? And second of all, assuming it does happen, what do I need to do? So on the front end, um, clear, non-discriminatory policies and practices, um, well understood throughout the organization, and clearly enforced in a consistent manner is not going to give you a, um, an exemption, but it's going to give you good risk management. Yeah, uh, I, I think the, the point is the more you can demonstrate that you looked at your, your 680 FICO cutoff and, and your down payment requirement and you looked at alternatives and you modeled those out and those started to adversely affect your ability to be a lender on a, on a prudent and, and cost-effective basis. That's the kind of thing I would like to be able to put forward to the DOJ when they come in and say, how dare you didn't have a 660 and a 3% down payment as compared to a 680 and a 10%. And then I think at some point people just have to stand up and say, you want to sue me, you want to sue me. Now, you know, not everybody wants to do that. And, uh, and I think a lot of this is just the luck, luck of the dice as to who gets picked on. Yeah, this is Richard Alexander. We're going to touch on this a little bit later, but I going back to... Brother Bartanian's question about kind of how do you create a safe harbor. I think one of the things that I see as the biggest challenge for, for financial institutions right now is the fact that with new players at the table, including people that are not prudential regulators, there really are no safe harbors. Um, we have situations in which uh, prudential regulators give someone a pass, but then CFPB, the Department of Justice can come in and you know, in an ad hoc way, make their own independent decisions. So I think that um, you know, in, in, a, in supervision that's supposed to be rules-based, principles-based, we are seeing more and more ad hocism, if that's such a word, in enforcement. And I think if you ask me in the themes um, Tom, that you identified, if I had had to add one, it would be that in some cases I don't know what to say to compliance officers because I think the rules are changing to meet particular goals and objectives of the day. Anybody else on fair lending before we, we move on? Okay, well, I, I think we have uh, sufficiently scared our audience with respect to where the law may be going there. So I want to move on now um, to uh, recent FDIC, DNO, and enforcement actions by the regulators, uh, including the Department of Justice, the CFPB. Um, and we've got a, a, a long laundry list of things here to discuss in terms of developments and trends in this area. Uh, what I want to start with, basically, is just to lay a foundation um, with regard to uh, some practical advice that we all try to give our clients in these situations. And Richard, I want to start with you. And looking back, just sort of summarize in your mind the mistakes that ought to be avoided uh, by a troubled institution, uh, both in terms of ultimate liability of the bank or institution or the liability of directors and officers. 
Yeah, so I'm going to take your question really in terms of, you know, what do you do when the die has been somewhat cast and it appears that a, a bank is careening toward um, governmental intervention? And, you know, I think uh, John Bill will talk a little bit about what we see as the kinds of cases that the government uh, brings. But there, there are a few things, and what I'm about to say is not necessarily what I think are things that should be avoided, but are things that I've seen officers and directors get themselves in trouble for not avoiding. So a couple things. I, I'm a big believer that quitting um, um, in the last weeks or months of a bank failing is not a good idea. Um, I'd rather be inside the tent and outside the tent when things are going downhill. Um, that is not to say that if you are forced as a director or an officer to take action that will incrementally increase your liability, particularly if you're, let's say, a holding company director, where I think this issue often um, emerges. Um, but, you know, a lot of people say, shouldn't I resign, shouldn't I resign, and I'm not convinced that's the best thing. Um, lawfully, what is it? It's not in order. Right. Yeah. Question well, and I think that's the exact right question that Ron is asking. Is that, you know, you have to temper that with whether or not you're being asked to do things to increase your liability. Um, but people think that by resigning, they're somehow extinguishing their liability, and I think that's a fool's errand. Um, you know, I think something that's it's not a mistake, but I think is very important, um, is that while you're there, it is important to make sure that the actions you've taken, and I'm focusing now from a director's perspective, as a director, have been appropriately memorialized. It is true that most lawsuits are about um, underwriting decisions and loan approvals, and I think John's going to touch upon that in a minute. But the fact is that directors provide oversight, and I think it's important that, a, that directors, while they're in this difficult period, make sure that there is a robust record in place about the actions that uh, they have taken, the proactive actions they have taken over the years and, and in the recent period in respect to um, <clears throat> their oversight of the institution. Um, as I mentioned before, conflicts, the bank holding company uh, conflict remains one that I think people need to be particularly attuned to. Um, keep in mind, by the way, that the issue of resignation can be a self-fulfilling prophecy because if everybody resigns, you give the regulators a basis to uh, tank the institution. Um, and just two other things that I mentioned that could be somewhat controversial. So as a defense lawyer, um, I want my clients to have access to information. Um, I personally think I'd be interested in John and, and Ryan and others who have made a, a different view. Um, I personally think a director is entitled to have copies of things that they relied on. Um, you know, if they had a board packet that was sent to their home um, and they reviewed, I don't think there's anything wrong with them having that. The FDIC has a very different view. They have a view of what I call the Alley North problem. They don't want uh, people sitting there and copying machines, copying uh, confidential supervisory communications, copying um, customer information, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the protocols that have been established. I think it's totally appropriate for a director to have access to the things that they decided. Um, and then in, in the form of not what is a mistake, a, a mistake that's been made but shouldn't be made is making sure that insurance coverage is obtained appropriately, that appropriate notices are sent out. Um, sometimes that is delegated to um, the wrong people who don't do it in a thoughtful way. I think it's very, very important that, that people who understand what the issues are, are focused on making sure that insurance companies are put on appropriate notice as, as a bank uh, careens toward um, failure. Uh, this is John Villa. Um, I agree with Richard. Um, we've looked at maybe a dozen to 15 FDIC recent complaints and worked through the cases. And I'll tell you there are three or four things that you could do as a director or officer of an institution that would dramatically improve your ability to respond to an FDIC claim. <laughs> Number one, <clears throat> when there is a regulatory criticism or an examination criticism that is leveled at you, make a comprehensive written response well documented. If necessary, go out and get an expert to respond to it and put it in the record. Now, the reason for this is that when the bank fails, the documents are in disarray. And what you have is a series of uh, accusations by the examiners against the bank directors and officers. When you interview the bank directors and officers, they said, yes, we were very good in responding to this. We, we did everything. I said, you know, like, where is the record of what you did? 
And the answer is, oh, I'm sure we can piece it together. At the time you were in charge of the bank, you had access to documents, you had access to employees, you had the time, and you had the money to respond to the accusations. And if you had put in a 10-page letter, when the bank ultimately fails and the FDIC picks it up, they have no, not only the complaint against you, that is to say the examination materials, but they have a response. And we will find that response, and it will make it enormously easier for us to A, convince the FDIC not to sue you, and B, to respond to a lawsuit if it comes. Because what you're going to learn is that in the months and years after a bank failure, even if the FDIC was making every possible effort to collect and produce documents to you, the documents are in disarray. And um, you need to have a comprehensive response. Number two, and we've seen this in a couple cases, it's a kind of an insidious problem. When the, when the institution is in trouble, the regulators, or sometimes some well-meaning officers or directors say, let's do a management study. And the management study then has questions that are directed to all the directors and officers, like, what do you think you did wrong? You know? and, uh, what could you have done better? Uh, do you think that the managers made some serious mistakes? Now, these people are, they're not, in, they're not thinking about the fact that they're basically writing a complaint against themselves, right? They're not going out and lawyering up. They're not thinking about this. They think candor and, you know, whatever they can say would make them feel better. They prepare a script which you're going to have to eat later. So all I'm saying is when they tell you to get a management study or when you think about getting a management study, take very special attention to the fact that it can be utilized against you. Number three, um, when you're meeting with a, you know, when you have an open bank, the regulators and the examiners, I think, are genuinely interested in your responses and are interested in preserving the safety and soundness of the bank. And in the exchanges with them, there are discussions, there are recognition by the examiners, you're doing a good job here, you're doing a good job there. Afterwards, we talk to the directors and say, well, what happened? They said, well, we had this meeting with the examiners and he said we did great on one, two, and three, and four. I said, oh yeah, well, where's the notes of that meeting? It's like, well, there are no notes. I said, are you kidding me? We had the examiner in here, he spoke to you, he spoke to you for two hours, nobody kept a record of that. Now, two years later, or three years later, that examiner might not work for the government anymore, he certainly doesn't remember it, and he's not highly motivated to help you. If you had put that together, it would have been instrumental in your defense. So those are three things that I think that we've seen in these cases that um, are very much blocking and tackling sort of stuff that if you did it, and I guess I'll add one more, <clears throat> and it's kind of a, it's so simple that it's probably insults your intelligence to say it to you. It has to do with loan files. I would say that 90% of the FDIC claims um, involve loans for reasons that uh, demonstrating that when a loan fails, it's a pretty easy identification of what the loss is. You may argue it's not proximately caused by the mis mis the mistake by directors and officers are alleged, but, but it's easy to quantify it. So they tend to go after loan cases almost exclusively in failed banks. And oftentimes they'll come after a bank and they will say, hey, you didn't have X, Y, and Z in the loan file, and you talked to the bankers afterwards, and they said, oh, yes, we did. I said, how difficult was it to have a darn checklist on the front of the loan file and to have it QC'd? Because now we have to argue the documents existed they simply were not put in the file, or if they were put in the file, they've been lost. And so it is a, and I've actually tried one very long case where we were tracking down documents for months to try to put them back in the loan file to demonstrate that in fact a financial statement had been secured, in fact a guarantor um, had uh, signed off on the document. And it's a relatively simple thing, and it is the principal Loans are, I think, almost exclusively in FDIC failed bank cases filed in federal district court are the basis of civil liability. And if you want to make a huge jump in helping your lawyer prepare for those claims, <coughs> put together a loan file. Yeah, now, I, and I, can I just jump in real quick? This is Ryan Scarborough. 
Um, one of the things that you should be aware of, when the FDIC seizes a bank on the weekend, uh, they come in, they make copies of do hard copy documents, but then later on they come in and take copies of the databases in which the loan files are maintained. And what most people don't recognize is the way banks keep their loan files electronically, they have a front end, they have a front end connection with a database and then they have the images stored in a back-end database that's separate. And when the FDIC comes in and takes copies of those, they sever the connection that exists between the front end and the images of the loan files. So you no longer have the ability to go in and press a button and pull up the underlying documents for that loan file. They are kept separately. They are, not, they are scanned, but they are not electronically searchable. And so now you no longer have the ability to find the underlying electronic versions of the loan files with any degree of reliability. So that's the point. And you have an assuming bank, which when Richard mentioned the loans and John, the loans and uh, the files get all messed up. Uh, you know, the files are transferred to a bank that acquires the failed institution. And who knows how they're kept in, at that new institution. So it is a major problem. Let me, let me point out that uh, a lot of what we're talking about here is applicable both in an enforcement proceeding or in a DNO case brought by the FDIC. All of these tips and all of these concepts are, are equally applicable. So I'm going to throw one out here that... Uh, that uh, Can I make just one comment on that? Yeah. And, and that's a distinction between the enforcement and the private litigation. Um, the enforcement often focuses on where the FDIC thinks there was um, improper conduct. Um, the private, the, the, not the private, the litigation by the FDC is really, the FDIC takes the Willie Sutton approach um, to failed bank litigation. Uh, what's the insurance policy look like? Are there rich, deep pockets on the board? And it's all about the money. And so when you think of that, you know, when you're preparing, when you're defending, unfortunately, at least in my experience, and others may have a different view, um, the principal driver is how much do they think they can get yeah, the facts uh, as, are as opposed to whether anybody ever did anything right. wrong. Right. Right. Whether the Great Recession or yeah. ever other things for the price and cost. Well, I think one of the reasons is that the FDIC civil litigation will strip the policy bare. I mean, in the FDIC civil litigation, I mean, if they're going to come after you and you save uh, any substantial amount on your policy, then you've done very, very well because the FDIC's primary concern is can we get that insurance policy. And so by the time they get to an enforcement action, you know, it's almost punitive. And we're going to get to the um, Gates memo, and I think that's going to be very important to evaluate not only what's happened in the last five years, but what's going to happen in the next five years as a result of it. But um, I, I agree with Andy, and I think it's a practical recognition of the fact that the uh, policy is being uh, uh, largely depleted. So let me, uh, let me throw out an issue that uh, I think is a crossover issue here, and, and it, it really goes to the question of preparation, enforcement. Um, and, and that is an issue that uh, seems to have been battled over the years over and over again, and, 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 and there still is no definitive answer, and that's the attorney-client privilege in a financial institution. Uh, everybody thinks there's an, there's an attorney-client privilege. I think there's almost no privilege left. Uh, and if you look what happened to, to, to consultants over the last few years who have been on the wrong end of either the regulators in the state, like New York, or federal regulators, uh, the banks were, were ultimately forced. You, you can debate whether the word was forced or not, but you ultimately forced to waive any privilege, even if those consultants were hired by lawyers, to advise the lawyers on advising the bank. And so, at the end of the day, if, if the regulators have so much force and effect on the, on the bank and can, and can put them in a position where waiver will keep them out of trouble or limit their liability, waiver is always going to occur. And so I don't think anybody in the financial institution ought to think that there's any privilege going on uh, at the time. Now, the second problem is, is that the, the changes in the statute that we're all aware of in 2006 that uh, allowed for a privilege to be maintained even if you gave information to the regulator has not solved the problem of whether the regulator gets the information. Because there was nothing in the law before except the examination privilege 
And there are many courts that have said the examination privilege, which I think is a logical matter, cannot trump the lawyer-client privilege. But what happened in 2006 is when the law was changed to say, if you give a document that's privileged to a regulator, the privilege is maintained. Now, that helps with regard to other third parties. But it's now put the regulators in the position of being more forceful when they say, well, now you can't withhold any documents because you have no rationale. And that's wrong. I mean, it's just flat out wrong. And we go through this over and over again. Somewhere in every one of these situations, you have to deal with the attorney-client privilege and have to fight about it. And you either have to compromise or go to court. And nobody wants to go to court over this issue. Yeah, so this, Richard, you know, I think you make two points. One, I, I'm just going back to your admonition for uh, mistakes to be avoided in vetting a troubled institution. You know, I, I think email in our, in our society, in our world, have become just a treasure trove. And, um, you know, I've just seen unbelievable emails among directors, for example, when things are about to go down um, that just would make your skin crawl. So I think to, to, to add to the list of being um, judicious about email, now I just push back a little bit about whether there's uh, an attorney-client privilege. I mean, if you look at, by way of example, the OCC's rules of practice and procedure, you know, there's limited discovery in those rules, and you can withhold documents on the basis of privilege. So, I mean, I think there are arguments to be made. Um, I think it's a little more complicated um, when you are defending, if you're providing legal advice in respect to a dispute with the OCC, I think it's a more compelling case than when you're giving legal advice to an institution that has failed, and then, there, you know, the FDIC has stepped in um, a, as receiver. So, I, I, I think what's happened, you're right, the, the regulators have pushed this I think pretty aggressively, but I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. This is a very practical issue, right, which is if the regulator says, give me what's in your file, and that's a privileged document, hard not to get, give it to them sometimes for the financial institution. If the, if, the, if the regulator says, well, go to your lawyer and get it and give it to me, that's, that's a whole lot better situation. And I think with financial institutions today, particularly in those last stages of going from trouble to fail, don't think about enough is not only what documents are created, um, but also what information gets into the possession, custody, and control of the financial institution itself. Um, there's lots of techniques to be used today to communicate, WebEx, um, PowerPoints by WebEx, things like that, but possession, custody, and control by the financial institution often makes it very difficult to preserve legitimate privileges. That's less of a problem if it's not in the bank's possession, custody, and control. Yeah, I, I think that I agree with Richard. Um, I, I think that uh, failed institutions or failing institutions should assume that they will never be able to protect their materials. And, and I think the one situation in which, um, it, it's interesting, I, I, do, I teach a class at Georgetown counseling the corporation in crisis for public companies. And um, I basically say there that if you are working for a public company today, you almost must assume that you don't have a privilege because if the pressure becomes great enough on the company, they're going to waive the privilege in order to um, absolve themselves of potential enforcement liability. And that's the same thing is doubly true of banks. So you can't assume that. The one situation where I do think you will get a privilege recognized is if you are dealing in an enforcement action and the advice that the lawyer gave you is in connection with the enforcement action. Their kind of litigation work product in anticipation of litigation privilege, you're going to do it. But otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for a financial institution to hold out privileged information from its primary regulator. All right, so uh, I'm going to move this along now um, to uh, some enforcement pointers and, and practical tips. And, and Ron, I want to ask you a question. Uh, as we've seen, there's been a, a lot of articles lately about ALJs and the use of administrative process among the agencies, and the SEC is in the headlines, I think, just yesterday on this. Um, so I guess the question comes back to the fairness of the administrative process uh, and the ability of institutions to sort of operate on a level playing field, which may not really be the case. Yeah. 
I, I'm troubled. I guess not only as to, but particularly as to individuals. Uh, the, the individuals who are subject to an enforcement action have r no real bargaining power. Uh, an institution may have some. On the other hand, with the uh, draconian laws we have, it's, uh, there's not a lot of discretion there. Uh, but the ALJ process has been challenged now with respect to the SEC, but I have not seen any challenges with respect to banking regulators. And the ALJ process is very similar uh, as to the banking regulators. Uh, and so I think they ought to look closely, too, at the fairness of the process. Uh, and that is, you know, the ALJ is, is appointed by the agencies. It comes off an OPM list, but it's the agency ma who makes the appointment. It's not an Article III judge, like you would have if you went to court. Uh, you don't get full discovery, as you do in court. Uh, you don't get a full trial, uh, nothing like a, a trial that you would get in court. Uh, and certainly, you don't get a jury trial. And then I think, ultimately, who's the decider? It's not an Article III judge. There's not the appellate process. In fact, the appellate process is, into, is to the head of the agency. Uh, so tell me that's fair. Uh, and so my, my sense is that the, we ought to look at the banking agencies the same way we're looking at the SEC now. And, and, and Congress ought to look at this, too, as to whether or not these cases ought to go to court, more of them, that, rather than go to the ALJ process. And in fact, it's the ALJ process, most, particularly individuals, don't want to take, there's, it's huge amounts of money to bring a, a to, to challenge an agency, uh, be, even before an administrative, administrative law judge. The, the, all the cards are stacked against you. So if you're constantly individuals, uh, you, you know, uh, you're saying, first of all, you know, if it's a prohibition order or, or even a, a severe civil money penalty, it's the reputational risk. Because once you go to the ALJ, all that is public. So there's a big push to settle these cases uh, and try to settle them with an MOU, which barely, rarely occurs anymore, uh, but at least with an order that has toned down language and is not so severe that you can't totally live with it. I think we've all probably yeah. seen over the last uh, several years, particularly since the crisis, uh, the trend of institutions to, to sort of say, look, let's just, let's just sign what the regulators give us. Well, why are we going to lawyer it? Why are we going to negotiate it? We, we want the regulators to like us, and if they like us, it will make our lives easier. Well, the problem with that is uh, that can backfire pretty dramatically. Uh, because if you sign a document that isn't your document and isn't negotiated to, to speak to the issues that you have, you end up with a document that either says things, you promise things you can't do, or you promise things on a timeline you can't do it, or you, you make commitments about risk management or capital or anything else that aren't going to happen. And quite frankly, uh, it must be about, I don't know how many years ago it is, but there is actually a situation we were brought into where uh, the board of directors had approved a, uh, an agreement that said that they would, quote, unquote, ensure the increased capital of the institution. When they didn't, quote, unquote, ensure the increased capital of the institution, the regulator threatened the CMP against the individual directors on the board for a failure to adhere to the written order. And so when people say to me, well, why do we have to negotiate this document, that's sort of exhibit number one. You know, one of the issues with the administrative process also is that there's no rules of evidence that apply. And so enforcement agencies, when they're going that route, aren't required in their mind's eye to actually go through the analytical route of how you put something into the market <coughs> and actually prove a viable cause of action. And this is a real problem because basically what you see on the front end is you see enforcement actions being brought and arguments being made when there's no practical, factual support for those arguments. And if those folks had to actually go in front of a district court judge and or a jury and prove their case, prove their basis for consumer injury or injury of some kind, and I'm speaking in particular about institutions like the CFPB or the SEC where the remedies are the same in both forums, um, I think that the playing field would be very different. And I think you'd see a very different set of outcomes than what we're seeing here. Um, what you have right now is you have a situation where a company gets an enforcement action or the, pro or the specter of an enforcement action. They're told that there's certain causes of action that they may have been, that may have been violated. But when you actually say to the lawyers on the other side, well, prove your case. What's your argument? How do you show causal link the way, for example, the Department of Justice has always had to in district court? You often get silence. And I think that this is a real constitutional issue, actually. And I'm, I'm very interested to see where the SEC cases go. Um, as someone who has um, a CFPB practice, I'm particularly interested from that perspective, too, 
because the administrative process um, at the CFPB is almost verbatim modeled after the SEC, right down to the ALJ who's on loan from the SEC. And I think we should stay tuned because this is a really, really, really big issue for all of these institutions and agencies. Yeah, this is Richard. I just wanted to make one other point about um, something that Tom said about language <laughs> and why language matters. So, um, you know, we've, we've gone from a world in which we had these kind of boilerplate settlement agreements to a world in which, by way of example, if you look at a FinCEN document in, a, in an AML case, they have detailed findings um, that they, are, they, they claim are required as a matter of policy. We're going to talk a little bit later about um, the fact that we're dealing with multi-agency penalty uh, you know, enforcement matters now. And these words um, count. Um, these are words in some of these settlement agreements that the, that the institution is being told they have to admit to um, as part of a settlement. Um, and you can argue till you're blue in your face that you, know, you were admitting it solely for purposes of settling um, this particular enforcement action, but the reality has become a challenge in, in parallel proceedings to distinguish uh, those set of facts. So language is more than just optics now. It really has implications in terms of these multi-jurisdictional settlements. All right, before we move on to the, uh, to the Yates document, uh, I want to just bring up one other development, and that is um, one of my favorite cases because it, uh, it, it actually included Harry Potter <laughs> in the district court. <laughs> uh, but, and Ron, I'm going to ask you to speak about this in a minute, but it's an interesting case because speaking of words mattering, Judge Boyle in 2014 in the Willetts case, which was an FDIC D&O case against directors and officers, said uh, with regard to this community bank that, where the directors and officers are being sued, the FDIC claims that the defendants were not only more prescient than the nation's most trusted bank regulators and economists, but that they disregarded their own foresight of the coming crisis in favor of making risky loans. Such an assertion is wholly implausible. We, we, we like to yeah, well, it's, it's, yeah. it's an interesting case because it juxtaposes 465 community banks that were taken over against large banks that were not taken over. And, the, and because of the 465 community banks were taken over, the directors and officers get sued. That went up uh, on appeal, and we now have the Rippey case in the, in the Fourth Circuit. So, Ron, why don't you tell us what that case says and what it does to Judge Boyle's uh, determination? Thank you, Tommy. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody around the table who filed amicus briefs in the uh, Fourth Circuit. We had tremendous support from um, lots of all the trade associations uh, uh, and so forth. Um, first of all, it's not a big bank, small bank issue here. This issue affects large banks and small banks. It had, this happened to FRAX, happened to be a community bank. Uh, but the case is also important because it, it would apply to derivative actions, not just suits brought by the FDIC. Um, in fact, the FDIC was suing as, as derivative. Um, the Fourth Circuit uh, affirmed a good part of what uh, Judge Boyle uh, held. Uh, there's summary judgment in favor of the director defendants. And, and I think this is a significant case. Uh, what, what number of points here, but one is Judge Boyle decided it on summary judgment. If you're a director or an officer, if you've got to go through a full trial uh, before a court decides a case, you've already lost it because you've lost two years of your, your life probably and your reputation. And so I think we were able to win the case on summary judgment in the district court, and lo and behold, the Fourth Circuit affirmed as to the outside directors the summary judgment, uh, just on the basis of, of the discovery record and so forth. So that, that I think, is, is significant. The other thing is that uh, North Carolina, like just, I guess almost all states, have uh, provisions in their statute which allow exculpatory clauses. There was a, uh, a bank or any corporation in their articles of association uh, can put an exculpatory clause in there saying that the directors can only be held liable, and in some states even officers can only held be held liable, usually for uh, insider abuse, conflicts of interest, that sort of thing, uh, and not for ordinary negligence or, or gross negligence even. Uh, and in this case, we had an exculpatory clause, which, uh, as the Fourth Circuit held, totally protected the outside directors. Uh, so the court affirmed as to the uh, d directors uh, and sent it back to, the, uh, to Judge Will. Uh, and things are still pending, so I've got to be careful as to what I say, but it was sent back uh, for uh, uh, further proceedings with respect to, to the officers, and we'll see what, what happens there. There's some good rulings. One, the court held not only as to the 
directors, but as to the office, I'm sorry, not only to the officers, uh, directors and officers, that there was no gross negligence. So again, on summary judgment, uh, the Fourth Circuit sustained the finding there was no, no gross negligence. Uh, we did defend on a couple of different grounds. One, the Great Recession. The Fourth Circuit said that could be, a, you know, may not be the sole proximate cause. You still got to look at whether these were, uh, you know, properly underwritten loans, but that is, in fact, the approximate defense. And similarly, the bank, like so many banks, Tom, uh, during this period, had good capital ratings. And the, the court held that, uh, in fact, that is, a basic, that, is, that is an evidentiary fact that you can, you can put in the record. Uh, and so uh, we'll see what happens, uh, you know, uh, on remand. Uh, but we think it's significant in terms of certainly directors, exculpatory uh, clauses, and the application of the business judgment rule. Okay, I want to throw out in the discussion now for the entire panel on the September 9, 2015 memorandum by Sally Quillian Yates uh, entitled Individual Accountability for Corporate Wrongdoing. As I, as I suggested at the beginning, I think we probably all saw this coming o over the last several years as a reaction to the uh, uh, sort of political Main Street uh, harumphing over what happened with the large banks. And so you could see this coming. Uh, I've, I've read the memo seven or eight times, and, and I just don't understand it. So I'm going to ask the panel to explain it to me. Because it, it, it's, it's a penetrating insight into the obvious, because either Either the Department of Justice is seeing something it never saw before, or it was ignoring cases it could have brought. Because otherwise, I'm not sure why there's a need for this memorandum. In my experience, having been involved in joint criminal uh, proceedings, joint civil and criminal proceedings that are going on uh, involving bankers, directors, and officers, and in a grand jury proceeding on the side, in those cases, it's, it's sort of been my experience that the Department of Justice is, has and always been pretty good at looking at these cases and investigating. But at the end of the day, to bring a case, you've got to have a crime committed. And just because a lot of people lost money doesn't mean a crime was committed. There has to be a crime committed, number one. Number two, you have to be able to prove the crime. And to prove the crime, you need two things. You need a prosecutor that understands the transaction, and these are pretty complicated transactions sometimes. And number two, you need a jury that can understand the transaction. And that's even harder. And so at the end of the day, it's not like nobody's looking for this. And quite frankly, and I remember from 30 years ago when I was a general counsel, we used to send over criminal referrals by the bushel to the Department of Justice. You couldn't get them to look at them. You'd have to get on the phone, you'd have to go over there and say, would you please look at this? They were so overwhelmed. And I assume they're still very much overwhelmed. So I guess the, the question I have for the panel is, what's the impact of this memorandum? So um, just to your original, your original question, which is what does it really mean? I think what it really means is the public doesn't think we've been doing what we think we've always been doing. So we're going to write a memo to tell the public that we're now going to do what we've always done so they'll get off our back. So does that mean anything changes from the yeah, view of our defensive? Here's what changes, okay? What changes is that the, the, the Department of Justice's principal way of ferreting out evidence of corporate wrongdoing is to deputize the corporation's counsel to do an internal investigation. And the practical effect of the Yates memo is it's now going to be impossible to do an effective internal investigation when you represent the company, because any officer or director who's read the Yates member or their neighbors read the Yates memo is going to lawyer up and insist on lawyering up immediately um, to avoid the Justice Department doing what it's now announced it's going to do, but which it has always done. <laughs> well, I, I got to say, I, I don't think that the Justice Department has, in these major corporate investigations outside of the financial services industry, gone out headhunting for lower level people just to, and I, I'm not suggesting that the Yates memo is a indication that they're out headhunting, but it, it, this does send a different sort of message that if you are a um, individual in, that's drawn into one of these corporate investigations, you have to think real hard about the importance of your job on the one hand and the importance of your, um, of your freedom on the other hand, because uh, until the dust settles as to how the department is going to deal with this, 
um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. And John, it sends a message. Does it make a difference, though? Well, I, I, it depends on what area you're talking about. I do believe, you know, we, everybody around this table, or most everybody, has been through the savings and loan crisis of the 80s and the aftermath of the 90s. And Never heard uh, of it. Yeah, right. You forgot it, actually. You, you heard about it. <laughs> oh, I caused yeah. it. That's right. <laughs> oh, I forgot about it. <laughs> um, but, you know, in those, in those crises, there was real misconduct. I've got to say, the, the reasons for the failures over the last six or seven years are a widespread economic downturn where certain banks were given funds and certain banks weren't, and the ones who weren't failed. And That's it, Judge it, 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 yeah. Right, and, yeah. and, and I don't think you're going to find the kind of egregious individual misconduct looking back over these cases that we uh, would expect even if you put them under a microscope. That said, I will say that you've got to remember one thing. For all of us around the table here, the sand is run through the hourglass with respect to the FDIC failed bank suits because the limitations is basically run. In enforcement actions, there's a four or five year window after the, after the person leaves the bank. FIREA is a 10 year statute. FIREA is a statute that the Justice Department enforces and if, this, if we're going to see any real impact of the Yates memo, it's going to be on civil FIREA cases. I don't think they're going to bring a lot of criminal cases in the banking sector because, honestly, I just don't see the misconduct to base it on. So, but I, I, I could see individual FIREA cases coming up just coming out of nowhere if this Yates memo is... Well, you, you, raised an, you raised a very interesting question, which we hadn't talked about a lot in terms of the Department of Justice being a new regulator, but the whole 1833A career thing, I mean, I don't think any of us who were around with the drafting of FERIA ever thought that when you gave the Department of Justice the authority to go after people who defrauded the bank, it meant they could go after the bank for defrauding itself. Right. Right? Yep. But that's where we are. All right? And until somebody challenges that, that's where it's, that's where it's going to go. It's not only not been challenged, it's been affirmed by three or four separate district court opinions that you can essentially engage in reflexive conduct under FIREA and 1833A contemplates right. that. But, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, in Atherton and some of these other cases, in O'Melveny, uh, FDIC yeah. versus O'Melveny, the, the Supreme Court does occasionally just kind of clear the decks and say, you people are all crazy, you know? There is no federal common law. What are you talking about? There's no common law that the FDIC must always win. If you go back and read some of these cases, and if this, if 1833A gets up to the Supreme Court, I am, you know, cautiously optimistic they're going to say, what, are you nuts? This, this was never intended right. to be moved, used against banks. It was to, be, to protect banks. And, you know, just because you can make a literal interpretation doesn't mean it should be like that. So I'm, I'm optimistic, but unless that... But in this good, environment, does anybody challenge that? Everybody seems to be rushing to settlement. Right? I mean, look yeah, at all the all times... reasons we get. Right? Yeah, look yeah. at all the look at all 1833A cases that have that have happened. They've all been settled and... No, they haven't. One of them's been litigated. Yeah, um, <laughs> one of them, a couple of them have been litigated. Yeah. Uh, so is anybody going to go to the Supreme Court? Who else? We hope so. Yeah. All right, we hope so, too. <laughs> we all hope so. I mean, but the... You know, I think 1833A is, a, is something we all have to watch out. FinCEN has enforcement authority. Uh, they've used it, and that's another one where the Justice Department has a big stroke. So you could see some FinCEN cases that you haven't seen in the past. But uh, let me just wait one final comment about this. You know, about two weeks ago, there was an article in the front page of every newspaper about how the Justice Department had released 6,000 prisoners. I don't know if you saw that. The biggest prisoner release, in, I think, in American <coughs> history on one day or something like that. And the reason was because the Justice Department realized that it was not, um, it was not cost effective to keep these people in prison. At some point, if they're chasing around a lot of people, which by the terms of this memo, they say, we don't care whether they can pay, we're going to sue them, we're going to pursue them forever. At some point, somebody's going to say, do we really want to utilize whatever law enforcement resources we have to chase around people who we acknowledge can't pay, okay, and who will never work in the industry again, rather than use these Justice Department lawyers on terrorists or elder abuse or something like that. So yeah. it, all, it all comes back yeah. to resources. Yeah. It all well, comes the back problem, to resources. You also have to turn it over to the agencies. Uh, as long before the AIDS memo, actually, I, I think you're seeing now uh, a, a trend to go after individuals 
of bond banking agencies. Absolutely. Uh, and, and there we have, again, these draconian administrative powers here and the, the, you know, the fact that you have to really settle here. And so even in cases where the statute is run, on DO cases, the, the FDIC is, and other agencies are, are looking at the facts to see whether or not there's an enforcement case because there's a five-year statute there. Well, look, don't we have a, it's very practical. If you're an enforcement agency and your job is to deal with issues in the financial services industry, you have two options. You can start going after individuals or you can testify before Senator Warren and others as to why you refuse to do so. <laughs> and, if, and, and, as, and, most, you know, and there are a lot of really courageous prosecutors out there who are only going to do the right thing at the Absolutely. right time. Right. There are other prosecutors out there who really would prefer <clears throat> not to have to provide that testimony before uh, Senator Warren's subcommittee. And right. this memo is written to prosecutors. Right? I mean, this memo is written to the U.S. Attorney's offices and the litigating divisions of the Department of Justice, and it's deliberately written that way to say to them, we're looking at you and we're putting a lot of pressure on you to go after individuals in your larger investigations. As a uh, practical matter, they always have. And that's a great segue to CFPB. So I'm I don't know what the segue is, Tom, but I, I, I don't want to take it. Well, it's people out of control. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so I, I, think I, that's, I think that's what Allison was saying, very clearly. So I'm going to relinquish my moderated duties to Ron Glantz now, who's going to bring us through the rest of the program. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about the CFPB pay lending and vehicle title lending. Um, let me address the first question, I guess, to Bob. Uh, what are the implications of CFPB's announcement that is, it is planning to issue a proposed rule that would dramatically curtail the current level of payday and vehicle title lending? Thank you, Ron. Before I answer that, I'd like to go back 15 minutes to something Allison was saying, which was unbelievably on point with a FDIC case from the district in New Mexico called FDIC versus C, which came out in March 2015. And in that case, the FDIC sued directors, sued officers of a failed bank in connection with loans, of course, uh, for negligence, gross negligence, and breach of fiduciary duty. The court dismissed the case on the basis of lack of constitutional standing because the FDIC apparently forgot to allege that any of these loans had caused any harm to the institution, any loss, or what was done wrong with them and the case was actually dismissed on that basis. Now, when you juxtapose that with the I don't have any answer as a, you know, at the administrative level, this exactly validates your point. Absolutely. I mean, you have to have Article III standing. Injury, in fact, to walk into court and show that there's a basis for seeking a remedy. One. Two, you have to be able to show a connection between alleged misconduct and injury. And what I'm seeing in my practice is that, con that connection isn't necessarily being made and nobody's forcing them to make it because everyone is settling these cases. If you actually go into court and you litigate a case in front of a district court judge, you probably won't even get to, you probably won't even get to summary judgment if you can't at the outset explain how the case works, what the cause of action is, and what the injury is. And you certainly won't get past summary judgment if you can't show that, and you definitely won't win a trial. And I think it's fascinating slash very disturbing, fascinating from an intellectual perspective and disturbing from an from a, from a enforcement defense perspective, that this sensibility hasn't infiltrated every single um, action that gets brought or contemplated at all of these different levels. And we're talking about the CFPB, so I will weigh in. And well, it really, it really puts a point on why the banking industry should be using the FCC ALJ situation as a basis to try to push to go to have district courts. Ron, I apologize for the digression. Okay, so payday lending. Uh, this is absolutely a fascinating thing that's going on here. Uh, the uh, CFPB put out essentially the equivalent of an advance notice of proposed rulemaking in connection with the Sabria uh, process in which it said, well, here's about 30 different things we might do. Take one from here, one from another. Basically, we hate, we hate payday lending and we hate vehicle title lending. And we are going to use the much feared 1031 unfair <laughs> and abusive practices thing to regulate out of existence a huge part of an entire industry, which for better or worse is legal under state law and it's not really regulated under 
federal law. To, to the extent we have not already done so under Operation Choke to in conjunction with our brethren at the Department of Justice and elsewhere. Well said. So, so I mean, you know, all this concern about 1031 and whether it be used, I mean, the sweeping scope of this is you essentially declare an entire legal industry to be an unfair and deceptive and abusive uh, practice. Now, this is all predicated on the idea of the debt trap. And, and I, I'm going to make the following observation. Life looks different to regulators in Washington than it does to people when you drive down a street in Kentucky or Tennessee or Wisconsin. And what, what is interesting is that some of the hearings, people have, with, with the director, the CFPB is in there, regular people have come up and said, I need to have access to this service. Now, I, I'm not saying 500% doesn't seem like a very high percent, but the reality is one thing that's not in this proposal is an option for people who will no longer have these services available to them right. if the rule goes through. Right. And, and well, I, it, because when you go to a large bank and say, I would like a loan for 25 days for $300, what is the response going to be in all likelihood? I think that's not, we don't make those kind of loans. Okay, so, so, so the big point here is that um, their, own, their own proposal looks to anywhere between a 60 and 70% reduction in the principal value of these types of loans, which is a pretty, pretty high, high percentage. And I, I, think, I think that we've got issues about whether this is an appropriate way to use 1031. But more interesting at the end of the day is a existential cost-benefit analysis question because they, they're in their own initial papers, they're admitting that this will cut off a substantial portion of credit availability. And I guess the benefit is that people will have this credit availability cut off to them because they shouldn't really be using it because it's bad. And, and that is, that's a different kind of cost-benefit analysis than we usually run across, and the CFPB, of course, is subject to sort of cost-benefit as compared to the banking agency. So I, I see this as going to be a potential titanic uh, battle uh, moving forward here. One of the issues that the CFPB struggles with as a high-level policy matter is how much they weigh in on suitability of products. And some of their enforcement actions have effectively, if you line them all up, created a policy that de facto creates a suitability analysis. And this is kind of a much more overt way of saying that. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm an alum of the agency, so that's the disclaimer here, but I think there are a number of different viewpoints at that agency about whether or not suitability is something that they should be opining on either in, implicitly in the actions that they pursue or explicitly as they seem to have been doing here. And I think it's something that will be really interesting to watch. The other observation I have about this is, um, you know, if you get rid of payday lending as it's, so as it's now called and you create an installment lending regime, which is what's contemplated, my question is, is who, there are going to be players in the market who continue to make payday loans to consumers, but they're not going to be people or companies that the CFPB necessarily wants hanging around, or they're going to be extremely large players. And so you're going to have a dynamic where you're either winnowing down the marketplace in a very restrictive way, or you're creating a whole kind of underground group of people who necessarily argue that they're outside the scope of jurisdiction altogether. And I'm interested in how that plays itself out. And I know that this has been discussed at the CFPB. You've heard it discussed publicly. Um, I think it's a difficult and somewhat intractable situation for them, frankly. Um, they haven't yet issued the rule. So, you know, I think that that's kind of where we are. Okay, to your, Allison, to your point, Andy, that there may be different views within the agency on whether they're in the business of deciding what's suitable and preventing mm -hmm. people who don't know what's good for themselves from right. buying products that are not suitable. There really isn't any debate in the only office that comes, the office of a director, right? And the director of the CFPB is very clear on his view and has directed the enforcement program in a very clear way that if we, the really smart people, don't think a product is good for consumers, they shouldn't be able to buy that product. Is that a fair summation? 
Um, yeah, one minute. Less than one minute. Um, you know, y yes and no. Um, I, I don't want to speak too out of school here. I, I do have some personal knowledge of this. Um, I would I would say that if you talk to folks, for example, in the market unit at the CFPB, you might get a slightly different perspective, Andy. Okay, let's move on, Andy. What about the Honda and Fifth Third indirect auto lending settlements? I know your firm was involved with those. Yeah. Yeah, and so I guess the the, the lessons are less about. Honda and Fifth Third, which just happened to be the two entities that settled. There's probably at least a dozen other investigations on exactly the same issue. And every indirect lender in the country could be accused of exactly the same thing. So I think the, the lesson is that um, there is no limit to the ardor of the CFPB and the Justice Department to use the disparate impact theory injudiciously approved by the United States Supreme Court um, for the purpose of getting them, the banks, to regulate third parties without regard to whether they even know the race of the borrower that the third party is making a loan to. Because remember, indirect auto is about and a dealer making a loan and then the dealer shopping the loan to different lenders and no lender has any idea what that dealer's overall pricing is, only those deals that they get. The other thing uh, to know, you know, to observe about the whole indirect lending enforcement investigation is why indirect lending? Because the dealers are about the only ones who beat um, the CFPB um, development team in Congress and got excluded and there's a lot of, you beat up, you think you beat us in Congress, we can't regulate you directly, that's fine, we'll deputize the banks and force them to be the regulator for us. So I think those are the lessons of the whole indirect auto thing. So Andy, in a district court action, I would judge react to hearing that these are proxy people, not real people. Um, yeah, I'll tell you the same thing I've told all of my clients. Even I can't lose that case defending a bank on an indirect auto discrimination uh, claim. What do you make of the data that underlies these cases? Because I think that that's also an issue that hasn't been litigated. You know, you put a statistician on the stand and you say, show us how this is statistically significant. There's no Humda collection here. There's no statutorily mandated collection or prescriptive way of collecting that data. It's all proxy data. Well, I will point to the me internal memos at the CFPB that have found their way into the press where um, many within the CFPB, Allison, have shared that observation that uh, their data is very flawed and their analysis of that flawed data is even more flawed. There's no way that they, I don't believe that they can prove this case um, even with a robust disparate impact standard. Uh, and it's just to date, nobody has been willing um, to challenge that. And uh, I think we're going to see that change at some point. Okay, let's move on to the uh, trade rule and the enforcement of class action litigation expectations. Uh, Andy, I guess uh, Director Cordway has indicated in recent congressional testimony that the CFPB will work with and provide the mortgage industry with some grace period. Uh, in order to c comply with the rule. What does that really mean, and will the other regulators take the same position? Well, I'll start with what that really means. Um, I think what that really means is kind of like the discussion before uh, about the QM rule. Um, we're going to provide uh, a brief period of moratorium on enforcing until we decide not to, and um, not clear how long that's going to be. But um, there is going to be pressure to make that a short period because of what we're going to see in private class action litigation. Because unlike uh, the RESPA rule where there was no private uh, right of action, um, TILA allows for a private right of action and there is under the NUTRID rule. And I will tell you, sometimes I'm in a room with plaintiff's class action lawyers, you know, uh, negotiating settlements. And when they, you know, when I get tired of hearing about their airplanes, I'll uh, ask what they're going to do next to provide the jet fuel, and many of them say trip. 
Um, uh, the plaintiff's class action bar is very, very much focused on that. Their view, and it's shared by a lot of the regulatory community, is this is really, really complicated stuff. Almost nobody is getting it right on day one, and it is um, a very fertile area for uh, private class action litigation. If that, in fact, happens, the regulators, uh, the CFPB and other regulators, are not going to be able to sit it out for long. Um, and I'm not quite sure that the industry has really grappled with uh, the potential here. Those of us who've been around a long time remember Rodash That's right. and uh, all of that litigation involving RESPA. Well, I think we're, uh, you know, we're in for the next Rodash era. Okay, well, speaking of litigation, uh, what about the, uh, the uh, statement now on the class action suits uh, being done away with in arbitration, arbitration clauses? Uh, there's nothing final here, I guess, but uh, what does all that mean? I mean, we've been waiting for uh, the CFPB's ruling on arbitration clauses, and uh, as I understand it, they're going to allow class actions. Well, I, I think, right, what it means is it's very clear from day one um, the CFPB has said, we don't, well, originally they said, we don't think arbit consumer arbitration should be permitted, particularly where it restricts the ability for class action litigation. Then they backed up and said, right. well, we're going to do a study to see whether. And we're right. Uh, whether, no, no, whether it's appropriate <laughs> yeah. or not. Yeah. Shockingly, that study has concluded that the original position was, in fact, the right position, and there's going to be a absolute war on uh, arbitration in the consumer space. And that's huge, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's huge. That's huge. I mean, this is, every bank in this country has arbitration clause. As a CFPB yeah. watcher, I think this is one of the biggest announcements that they've yeah. ever made in their four and a half years of existence because this affects not just consumer finance companies, this affects any company that would be a consumer finance company. And as we that's speak, that number is exponentially increasing. And um, it also affects two, you know, Concepcion um, and Italian colors. I mean, two big Supreme Court cases that came down that concern arbitration as well. And so, it's, it's very interesting to me, given the political environment in which the CFPB operates, that this is something that they are taking on as a rulemaking. The, the statute requires that they engage in a study. Um, it mandates a study, the, the Dodd-Frank Act, and they have done a two-part study. Um, it, doesn't, it, it contemplates but doesn't necessitate rulemaking. And so um, I'm, I'm absolutely um, intrigued by this because it, it seems like a huge political battle to take on and an enormous one to take on with two years left on the director's time. And frankly, there's a lot of other things out there that probably would be easier and more obvious things for the Bureau to tackle. Also, oh, Alison, don't you think when the, when the Bureau was in its formative stage, if you looked up on a whiteboard in the rule, it would, the two, of the, two of the first five bullets would be get the auto dealers and get arbitration. <laughs> and so to their credit, right, they are, they are fulfilling a very clear day one agenda. And uh, its implications are going to be quite significant, but there's no surprise here. No, and nobody's surprised by it. And it's in the statute. I mean, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the statute. It says the CFPB shall do an arbitration study. And they have done that. And they have put very, I mean, I know a lot of the people who've written the study. They're very thoughtful people. A lot of them came from the private sector. They've been in this world. Um, but it, there's a big difference between a study and an actual rulemaking that fundamentally and structurally changes all of these agreements, and not just the agreements that affect the obvious consumer finance players, but really any company that could, in the foreseeable future, offer a consumer finance co product. And I'm talking about Facebook, Apple, Google, I mean, all of those companies that are merging into the payment space. They're all going to be captured by this. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, we've got to move on. Yeah. Going. We move on. I'm going to uh, use my moderator's uh, executive authority and skip over Operation Choke Point. I think we've already discussed that. And let's move to cybersecurity and privacy and BSA AML. Uh, are you, uh, and the first question I guess is directed to Andy again, are you starting to see active enforcement by prudential regulators and others with respect to cybersecurity compliance failures and breaches? Yes, um, there is there's enormous frustration in the regulatory community uh, about the potential threats that cybersecurity provides and what they perceive as um, uh, the response by uh, financial institutions that they regulate. Um, they view, I think the regulatory community views this as the next place where they can be accused of being asleep at the switch. 
and they're determined not to let that happen. And in having many, many conversations with regulators on this issue, their fundamental concern is that IT owns cybersecurity in many institutions and compliance, yeah. risk, and legal tend to have a too, in their view, too limited a role. And IT is all about the, the bells and whistles that prevent breaches. And the view of the regulators is that there are breaches and there will be breaches. And how are you going to deal with them? And because IB sometimes elbows the compliance and risk functions out, that many institutions don't have strong programs in place for how they would deal with issues and aren't sufficiently attentive to looking over IT shoulder because they don't understand the language, they don't understand the technology in terms of probing whether IT certainty that there can't be a breach is really well placed. You're going to see examiners look very, very closely yes. because of this area. I think we're already seeing that. Uh, let me turn to Richard now. Yeah, what? Just, yeah, Richard, you, please. One thing I mentioned to the people that scared the heck out of the, the lawyers on the, on the webinar, which is that, you know, what we are seeing with increasing frequency is that to the extent that financial services companies are being required to have robust IT protocols to address cybersecurity issues, this is extending, it's being outsourced to their vendors. And I, I suspect many of us have received inquiries, surveys, uh, contracts, requirements from our, our financial services clients where they are asking us to have as robust a plan in respect to our information and our interaction with them as they have for themselves. So this is going to be a shared risk and responsibility for those of us in the financial services space. And we're also saying with respect to the vendors, the FFIEC examinations are getting tougher and they're, they're taking enforcement action against third-party vendors. So it's an area that obviously everybody ought to be very, uh, you know, aware of now and, and advise your clients. Uh, okay, Richard, what uh, constitutes a uh, good BSA program? Uh, yeah, so we, we could talk um, for three or four hours about <laughs> BSA and we only have a limited period of time. So I thought I'd just mention a couple things, um, once again, to be provocative and to scare people a little bit and to have them focus on, on the issues here. So, you know, I can close my eyes uh, back to 1985, 1982, 1985, and when we thought BSA was going to go away and go through the whole history and the impact of 9-11, but, you know, anybody thinks that we're not going to continue to see BSA, ANL, OFAC as an important part of the regulatory um, regime is um, smoking something. Um, it continues to be very, very much an important part of the enforcement lexicon. And it also, unfortunately, given the high stakes, uh, it, is a, it is a program, a requirement that oftentimes leaves institutions vulnerable to the least trained, uh, you know, lowest compensated people. You know, oftentimes banks get into trouble uh, for the acts of a teller or someone in the wire room. Um, and so it's a very, very scary set of um, requirements. Uh, in that regard, I want to just mention a couple things. Um, Tarullo and Dudley and, and Curry, all in a somewhat of a coordinated way, gave a bunch of speeches last year about the culture of compliance. They got a lot of attention. Um, they had different perspectives and different agenda in, um, in talking about this. Some it was in respect to incentive compensation. Um, but, but Curry, in particular, gave a speech earlier in the year. And I wanted to just read a couple things from it, which I think are important to team this issue up. You know, he talks about how he thought the, the banking industry as a whole was getting more compliant with BSA AML, but they were continuing to see problems. And he says, the fact is when we look at the issues underlying BSA infractions, they can almost always be traced back to decisions and actions of the institution's board and senior management. So going back to what we were talking about, about Yates and about whether there's a change, you have the controller making a speech he doesn't do, he's not doing this because he was bored that day. He's trying to send a signal. Um, and he goes on in his speech when he describes all of these, um, the kinds of things that they expect. He says, and that brings me to the question of management accountability. It's one thing to impose significant civil money penalties or to lower the bank's management. Rate, but those are actions that are absorbed by the shareholders and the institution broadly. 
I am asking this. Shouldn't we as bank supervisors demand that institutions designated hold senior managers responsible for BSA risk management just as they would for any other line of business? Um, he says, well, it doesn't mean we're penalizing honest mistakes or errors in judgment or even minor failures in compliance. Um, where there's been a serious breakdown in BSA compliance as a result of a conscious decision not to commit the requisite resources and expertise necessary to maintain a program, someone has to be held accountable. So, you know, my, my uh, comment to everybody is this. I don't believe there's a BSA program in the United States that's ever going to be robust enough, um, that's never going to be good enough. Um, there are enormous amount of subjective judgments that need to be made along the way and a lot of second guessing that goes on in respect to the evaluation of those programs. Um, keep in mind there's a statute that says there shall be a cease and desist order when there's a program violation. A program violation is in the eye of the beholder, but you just need to consider that in the context of these speeches about senior management accountability. So I think you're going to continue to see this to be a major, major focus of supervision. Um, I would say, I think all of our practices that used to be 90% safety and soundness or 90% compliance, whether consumer, BSA, AML, we're continuing to see that. We're continuing to see very, very large uh, penalties brought. And then the last thing I'd say, um, and this may tie into some of the, the discussion we're going to have with the rest of the panel, is this. There's probably not an area more fraught with multi-agency risk than there is in the BSA AML area. Um, if you look at um, just a couple of the penalty actions taken over the last few years, the major FinCEN penalties, um, there was one in the middle of the year, the Bank of Mingo. Um, with respect to the people from Bank of Mingo, I don't know where you are. You're $94 million in assets. You paid $4.5 million penalty. Um, of which two and a half million was concurrent and forfeited pursuant to a deferred prosecution agreement. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase, Saddle River, you know, there, there have been enormous penalties and many, many of them have been um, imposed in connection with uh, actions, civil actions brought by the prudential regulators and actions brought by the United States Attorney's Office, deferred prosecutions and the like. So this, you know, this is continuing to be an area of, of um, significant regulatory criticism and focus and one that I don't think anybody can ever be good enough because the goal yeah, are constantly and, moving. And personal liability now by individuals, compliance officers. Tom, let me turn it over to you. I think we have some time for questions. Uh, um, yeah, and, uh, we do have some questions that have come in, so let me... Uh, so there's a question on civil money penalties and uh, apart from the ramifications that are obvious, uh, the question is uh, whether uh, an executive who has been hit with a civil money penalty wears uh, a scarlet letter through the rest of their career. Richard? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. It's a question that comes up all the time, and I think in large part it depends on um, what that person intends to do with the rest of their life because, uh, you know, I, I'd urge someone who's in that situation to consider um, you know, what the licensing requirements um, are. Um, if you're going into the insurance business or any regulated industry, the SEC industry of banking, I, I think it makes it very, very difficult, for example, um, to become, to continue to be a banker um, by way of example uh, in other regulated institutions. So it, it is an issue. Um, I think the size of the penalty matters, the role. Um, that you played matters, but I think in and of itself the existence of a penalty that creates a significant obstacle that people need to overcome. It really shifts the burden, I think, from having to be able to demonstrate that there's not a basis to keep you out of a, uh, an otherwise regulated entity. Okay, the next question is on a disparate impact. So Andy, uh, this is a terrific question from a different perspective. Do do you have any insight on regulatory scrutiny surrounding marketing efforts? Uh, what are lenders and banks doing to mitigate disparate impact redlining risks in their marketing efforts, i.e. pre-screening? That is, it's a, it's a great question. It's a very real issue. It's the subject of many examinations, not just at the CFPB, but also at the prudential regulators. 
And it really goes back to what we talked about before in terms of being proactive. Um, you know, look to see where your marketing may be viewed as having a disparate, you know, a disparate impact. Um, look hard at whether there are ways you can modify your practices to diminish that impact. Uh, adopt those you can to the extent consistent with your business model. Uh, you really can't make meaningful changes. Uh, document the thought process and the effort to figure that out and the reasons why you've reached that conclusion. Understand that business justification is not a magic bullet and all you're really doing is moving yourself on the risk continuum, but by doing those kinds of things you can really move yourself on the risk continuum, but it really it is an issue. It's an issue that's being focused on today. Next question, Ryan, I'm going to direct this to you. Uh, is DNO coverage typically on a claims made basis or a occurrence basis? Uh, it's, on a it's on a claims made basis, typically. And uh, the claim has to, obviously the claim has to come in within the, uh, within the period that the policy covers. Uh, and you can purchase, you can purchase a uh, extender provision for the cover, for the policy that will give you an additional year mm -hmm. or potentially longer if you purchase it. Uh, but you need to put them you need to put the insurer on notice as soon as you have circumstances that would warrant it because you do run the risk that the insurer uh, will uh, use use that as a justification for refusing to advance defense costs. Uh, I should say that, that you've just heard from Ryan Scarborough, who's a partner at Williams and Connolly. He's actually the brains of every case I work on, and I asked Ryan to come <laughs> over <laughs> and answer the tough questions for me. Uh, this is John Bell. So uh, let me just point out, too, uh, we do a lot of work in this area. It's notice of circumstances, as Brian was saying, is very, very important. And again, I think as John Villa pointed out, that sometimes these aren't done by folks who really have a lot of expertise in this area. You should have a good broker, uh, and, and it's very important to make sure that that is done right. Well, increasingly, I find that on the defense side, particularly in these kind of cases, <coughs> I don't go anywhere without my coverage lawyer. Um, insurers are doing the very best they can to avoid coverage on all these kinds of claims. And there's a whole legal specialty, you know, and sometimes we enforcement lawyers don't think through all the issues in the mm -hmm. same way the coverage lawyers do. So I rarely go anywhere anymore without my coverage lawyer. Well, you know, it's an interesting point you make about rarely going anywhere without your coverage lawyer because uh, I agree with that. But I rarely in the last 15 years go anywhere without my criminal lawyer on my side also. And I can remember long before that where the concept of criminal law, maybe before the Crime Control Act of 1990, John, but long before that, I don't think we ever thought about criminal liability to the extent that we do now. And now, I think it's on every case. You have to ask that question. And the complications that it creates are just massive, particularly when there's multiple regulators, multiple discovery processes going on, and the Department of Justice comes in and says, hold on, everybody, our, our process is superior here. You've got to let us finish. And you can't construct a global settlement. You, you know, you're giving. It's just a, you know a complete morass. And I can remember a few studies done uh, after the Crime Control Act in 1990 and FERIA, which were basically the beginning of the criminalization of the banking business, where it was proven that there were certain crimes that you could commit from behind the desk in a bank that would get you more time in a federal pen penitentiary than, than, than robbing the bank with a gun and a ski mask through the front door. Now, one might argue, and, uh, and I'm the first to say, that if you read the surveys that have just come out in the last six months uh, of Americans who believe that by a huge majority, that banks need to be more regulated and further restricted, I don't think those stories have much traction, quite frankly. But we are at an interesting juxtaposition here in terms of actually running a business that can serve its shareholders and the economy <laughs> and, 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 abs and not be turned into a public utility because of all these laws that are being heaped on its back. And people can make the political and the policy choices that they want, but I think the dynamics are pretty clearly out there. And I think what I'd like to finish with is just this question of the criminalization of the business and what that means. Well, let me... <coughs> um, I'll make one observation, maybe two. The first one is 
probably three. No, two. Uh, <laughs> the first one is that for a long time, I think there was great concern about bringing criminal charges against a financial institution. As a result of the collapse of, you know, going going back 20 or 30 years, um, uh, and uh, a number of institutions, um, uh, most recently Arthur Anderson is not a financial institution, but the notion of bringing criminal charges against financial institutions was um, an anathema. They started moving toward bringing it against subsidiaries, and now I think the federal government is at the point of seriously considering bringing criminal charges against significant financial institutions. And that changes the entire <coughs> game. Uh, because now you have to think twice about how, how people are going to come after you in a way that I don't think you ever, you didn't have to do before 2008, and you hoped you didn't have to do by 2014. So I think in that sense, there's a, we're about to see a real tectonic shift in the in uh, the enforcement against financial institutions. With respect to individuals, I would say that the Yates memo and uh, the increased pressure on, you know, state's attorney general, I mean, take a look at what happened in New York. We've been talking about the federalism, but in New York, you, you are subject to all kinds of potential <coughs> liability in ways that you could never have imagined, and, that, and in some other states, but primarily in New York. So you have to ask yourself today, when you're looking at a potential enforcement issue, why isn't it criminal? Not why is it criminal? Because I think uh, the next five or ten years are going to be a very rough time until hopefully we start evening out. Yeah, and this, Richard, I, you know, just two observations. I have two stupid expressions. One is the competition and repressiveness. And I think one of the things is, you know, we used to have the competition of laxity among regulators, and now we have the competition and repressiveness. And I bet we see a lot of that going on here. Um, but the other part of this that makes it so exquisitely difficult is um, what I call the need for regulatory equilibrium. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the fact that no one litigates these cases and why don't they litigate it. And, you know, the reality is that it's very, very hard to be a highly regulated institution and be at war with your regulators for any number of reasons. It puts you in the penalty box. Um, um, with great respect to my former colleagues, it tends to result in some more difficult, uh, you know, dare I say, retaliation. It is very, very difficult um, to be in that world. But adding the Department of Justice just adds another element to it that just makes it very, very difficult to have regulatory equilibrium. And what I'm seeing with increasing frequency is the willingness of the civil, you know, prudential regulators, particularly in the BSA area, to come to the table and have a discussion. But then having a Department of Justice investigation, a criminal investigation out there hanging with no sense of timing. Right, it goes on and on. And, 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 and so what are you supposed to do? And you find yourself in this, this ungodly position as a defense lawyer of having to, to walk into the Department of Justice hand in hand, you know, and, look and, and say, okay, we've got the, you know, what, let, let's talk. Um, wh why are we doing this? Why isn't government you know, operating in some kind of coordinated way? And um, it is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that financial institutions have to face in light of this, these new players. You know, you add to it the complexities of the CFPB, which views itself, in my judgment, as a police agency as opposed to a prudential regulator. You've got um, EFS in New York, who's, you know, we've got another three hours for that conversation. And people have very different agendas. And it just seems to me that the industry needs to engage in a discussion about what public policy interests are served by insured deposits and, and the confidence in these institutions being put at risk by all these competing considerations. And we used to have a lead regulator using these big cases. You had one lead regulator, and every all the other agencies would follow that. That, that was the food price. Right. That was the whole yeah. idea, yeah. In part about some right. of the, the you know, right. who's in charge. And it seems to me that we've gotten now to a point where there are more people at the table, um, you know, wanting something for themselves. So don't you think their agendas are shorter now? I mean, I, I, I had the sense that regulators looked at their industries <coughs> over a five or ten or fifteen year time span, and now you think their agendas are two years, you know, or until the next uh, congressional hearing. So I, I find that, you know, their motivations are some that I think are going to be difficult for us to, to move with logic. Well, the There's problem. a lot of political pressure animating that. that right. Is, well, I mean, that's what DFS is. I mean, and, and the problem is we have parallel universes here, really. I mean, you've got the real world of what's actually going on, and you've got the political public press release world. 
in April of 2013, some of the things that Eric Holder was saying about too big to jail and going after individuals, which was long before the Yates memo, uh, in inspired me to write an article which essentially said that, and I, and I offered a lot of numbers, and I'll read you a sentence or two just to end this, because I think it does punctuate the point. There is no business in this world, not in this world, where the executives are under more pressure, more prosecution, and more actions than in the banking business in this country. I defy anybody to find me an industry where there is that much recrimination that comes back at them for what they do. And there's just one paragraph. So organized I, crime is a close second. Right, right. <laughs> in the, I'll just read you one paragraph of this. In the banking crisis between 1985 and 1982, uh, more than 2,100 banks and thrifts were closed. The FDIC, RTC, brought claims against directors and officers in 25% of those bank failures. Um, Fast forwarding to the current crisis, the FDIC has authorized suits in connection with over 100 failed institutions against 860 directors and officers. This includes 53 director and officer lawsuits, five of which were settled, one of which resulted in favorable jury verdict, naming 401 former directors and officers. Between 2008 and 2012, the banking agencies issued more than 4,700 administrative orders many of which targeted directors and officers and other employees, including <coughs> prohibitions and removal from office. In 2012, more than 830 formal enforcement actions were brought against banks and holding companies. Of the 282 brought by the OCC and the 484 brought by the FDIC that year, um, more than half appear to have included charges against directors and officers and individuals at a bank. Now, I don't think you can say that about any other industry in the, in the world. And so the reality is, um, in one universe, is that people believe that banks are not regulated and there's no enforcement and nobody goes to jail. And the reality in the real record world is, is just the, the record is just the opposite. And I, and I don't know how anybody will either meld those two worlds or care to, but that's the conundrum we've got. Well, we want to thank our speakers, uh, Richard, Allison, uh, Bob, Andrew, Tom, uh, John, and Ryan. Uh, thank, and thank you, audience, for listening in, uh, and we hope this has been very useful for you. Thank you.